You don't have to be a race fan to get cold chills from hearing those words. Gentlemen, start your engines and then hear and then hear that mighty roar of those big engines right there in the middle of all those 300,000 screaming wild frenzied fans. Last Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, the 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 was held with Ryan Hunter Ray edging out three-time champion Elio Castro Nevis by just a fraction of a second to become the first American since 2006 to win what many in sports consider the greatest spectacle in racing. Now, now you can quickly ask the question, rightfully so, Jim, what in the world does that have to do with anything in this sanctuary on this first Sunday morning in June? But bear with me, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this analogy, this clip, will help you remember several important points this morning. You see, this part of the country, in this part of the country, and, and unless you're a racing fan, I would suspect the majority of us are not. We may not even known that the biggest race in motorsports was hell last Sunday. I've been to the Indy Raceway, and not on race day, but on the qualifying event leading into the actual race itself, and I have to admit, without knowing anything at all about those cars or most of those drivers, I got a little taken in by it all. But I'm not a racing fan. I don't keep up with it at all. I like to say I follow real sports. Some of us in this church today were, were following a real sport last weekend in Oklahoma City at the Big 12 Baseball Championship. And by the way, did you see how those Raiders did this weekend? I didn't remember that it was actually Indy 500 Sunday until I saw the news report. It flew right by without, without a thought for many of us. In the same way, for many Christians, this past Thursday, just a few days ago, flew right by without much thought. It's a significant day for all of us as Christians. Thursday was the 40th day after Easter. It is the day called Ascension Day. And we mark today as Ascension Sunday the last day of the Easter season in our Christian calendars. Ascension Day, that day, is one of the most forgotten days in our Christian calendars, and yet it is so unbelievably significant. In a book called Feasting on the Word, Sean White writes the following. I don't want to read this. I suspect no other festival in the Christian year is more important and less emphasized than the ascension of the Lord. At the heart of our confession stand the crucifixion and the resurrection, and a close second is the founding of the church at Pentecost. Doubtless, our communal life depends on the certainty of these seminal events, but the transformation of that timid band of believers, fearfully hovering in silence, remains inexplicably apart from the ascension of the Lord. Likewise, the theological shift from proclaiming the kingdom of God to announcing Jesus is Lord also germinates in the disciples' experience at Jesus' departure. Today's message is based on Acts 1, first chapter of Acts, the first 11 verses. And I'd like to read these words of Scripture now. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, 
which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And before he said this, he was taken up. I mean, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The books of, the books of Luke and Acts were written to a person named Theophilus. Now, there are a host of theories about who this person was uh, but, and who he may have been, but nobody really knows for sure. Luke, Luke the physician, is known to us to be a very detailed, careful historian. He was a writer whose words are generally accepted as being fairly accurate, in fact, real accurate. Other than for one verse at the end of the book of Mark's gospel, Luke was the only apostle who documented the ascension of Jesus into the heavens with any type of descriptive detail. He dated the event exactly 40 days after the resurrection. He documented that there were witnesses. He said in verse 9, if you'll recall, they were t he was taken up before their very eyes. I'd like for us to carefully look at this scripture today, sort of take it apart, paraphrase a little, and try to put our ourselves in the sandals of the apostles that day. Here they are, and they're still confused. They believe Jesus was the Lord who was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They had seen miracles performed, watched Jesus be tried and crucified, and now they know by first-hand account he has risen from the dead. Wouldn't that be enough to confuse any of us? They still think he's the one that's that's going to restore Israel. And now, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to them in and out over a period of 40 days. He tells them in verse 4, and they follow the instruction, to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift God promised. They really had no idea what was coming. Jesus told them that John baptized with water, but in a few days, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you think we could have understood what that meant? It's obvious to us today that Jesus was talking about Pentecost. But right then, at that place, in their sandals, did they understand at that very moment? Then they asked him if he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Remember, that's what they thought he was here for to begin with. And Jesus almost brushes off that question, telling them that it's not for them to know the time or the dates. In other words, I like to think of it like this and paraphrase that Jesus was telling them this. You don't need to worry about that. You've got bigger things to deal with. The powers of the Holy Spirit are going to come on you and you're going to spread my message all over the earth. Do you think that would have soaked in right then and right there in that place to us? Among and amid that confusion that had to exist, I, I don't think so. And I don't think it sunk into them at that absolute second either. Well, right after Jesus said that, right before their very eyes, as Luke puts it, Jesus was taken up until a cloud hid him from their sight. He ascends into the sky until he disappears. How would we react? The historical account then tells us that they stood there watching as Jesus ascended into the heavens. It says they were looking intently. Yeah, I think so probably. How about looking absolutely dumbfounded? Wouldn't we be? 
They've witnessed all this stuff, and now this? Then out of nowhere, two guys appear in white. And they say, hey, you guys, what in the world are you standing here looking up in the sky for? Don't you get it? This is Jesus, and he's gone into heaven the same way he's going to return someday. We don't know who these two guys were. Most theologians will agree that they were angels. In fact, some translations will say that they were actually hovering above as they looked into the sky. Others don't. But they were saying to these guys, don't you get it? You're about to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you're going to preach to all nations. Quit standing here in awe, gentlemen. Start your engines. The race is about to be on. And it served to center them. In the last verse of the book of Luke, we learn that after Jesus disappeared into the sky, the disciples returned to the room in Jerusalem where they had been staying And they returned there, the Bible tells us, with great joy. And they stayed there continually praising the Lord. Suddenly, they were not so anxious anymore. Consider now the significance of this event. For for some critics and students of science, the ascension is as hard to believe as the virgin birth, the miracles, the resurrection. It's supernatural. We have to agree to that. Some critics joke that that Jesus was the first astronaut blasting off into space. But those of us who believe should consider. Jesus' appearance after after the resurrection seemed to further confuse the disciples. Sure, they understood it was him, but they were human. After all, it's not every day that a person who was dead then walks and talks with you. It was the only time, it was only, only at the time of ascension when the two angels appeared and they were shocked into reality that they began to understand the glory that shaped the Christian proclamation. It set them on a course that changed the world forever. Sean White writes, The ascending Christ extends a blessing to those who are watching him disappear. With this conveyance of divine power, Jesus becomes something for the disciples that he had never been before. Returning to that room, they joyfully worshipped him and uninhibited, they remained praising God. Carl Barth, many of you have read his writing, says, there is rel- There's a relatively thin line in the New Testament which speaks of Christ's ascent into heaven. But in these moments an ultimately unrivaled historical turning point occurs. So, why the Indy 500 clip today? What was the whole point? A racing team cannot separate the season of preparation from the checkered flag. Only a well-set-up car, good research, and a very well-prepared driver will be able to reach the finish line at all. We cannot separate the resurrection from the ascension. Through the crucifixion and resurrection, salvation of the world was accomplished by this person who God sent from the heavens. The ascension brings to a final conclusion Jesus' earthly ministry and confirms his place in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. I'm told that a race car's driver's thoughts and emotions are filled with Doubt and fear and uncertainty and anxiety right up until the time that he flips the switch and starts the race car and hears the roar of the engine. When the race is on, they drive with confidence and all their focus is on that finish line. From the first time the disciples met Jesus, their lives were absolutely consumed with awe, doubts, fears, uncertainties, and confusion until the ascension and the event of Pentecost a week later. After the ascension, their focus centered on God with complete confidence in their beliefs. We are living in what some consider in-between times. Let's call that. 
The time in between when Christ ascended into the heaven and, and the time when he returns. What we do with this time makes all the difference in the world. Can we, will we, become more focused on sharing our faith with others in our walk through this life? Will we spread the news to our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and those we don't even know? Will we focus on the finish line as we deal with those everyday irritating little things and people in our lives? Will we run a good race? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time we start our engines. Let's pray. Father and God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the significance of the ascension of your Son back into the heavens to sit at your right hand. Lord, be with us as we go through this week. Help us to run a good race for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. If you'd like to unite with this congregation, either through transfer of membership and or first-time proclamation of your faith, we'd be delighted to have you come down as we stand and sing Blessed Assurance. <laughs>